Incompetent people surround me wherever I go And I wish it wasn't out of line to tell them so The waiter never seems to get my order right Seems like I got to complain almost every night How much longer can I take this abuse? I try to be nice, but what's the use? When I'm the only one that does anything right Sometimes it seems like the world is run by chimpanzees Even though some of them might come with college degrees to separate the facts from fiction but i think i can say with obvious conviction that in this old world everybody's wrong but me Welcome to Uncommon Sense. My name is Charlotte Laws, and today we're going to be discussing cable news and the fairness doctrine, best cities to earn a living, breaching someone's private data on the internet, and Munchausen syndrome, which is claiming to have cancer or another fatal illness in order to get sympathy. But first I'd like to introduce my esteemed panelists. First I have Mr. Charles Parcell, who's an attorney and a mediator. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And then I have Mr. Bryce Devincenzi. Very good. <laughs> Got it right that time. Mm -hmm. Who's a real estate agent and has a great interest in politics. So welcome to the show. And I thought we'd start out with Munchausen syndrome, which um, is a kind of an unusual illness. I don't think too many people have it, but there was a news story about a woman who has faked cancer three times. She's a teacher, so mm -hmm. every time she'd start a school, and then she'd say she has cancer, and she'd shave her head like she was going through chemotherapy, and she'd get all the sympathy from everyone. Then they'd find her out. She'd have to you know, leave the school, and then she'd go to a different state or a different city and mm -hmm. join another school, and this has happened three times now. And um, I, you were telling me that you actually knew someone who had Munchausen by proxy, which... Um, well, I'm not personally, but um, apparently uh, the rap star Eminem, uh, his mother suffered from Munchausen syndrome initially, mm -hmm. and then Munchausen syndrome by proxy and kept saying that her child was sick. And right. then Marshall Mathers. Um, so it basically uh, lended itself to a very unstable home life for him. Yeah, I mean, much of the vice so. proxy is extremely a dangerous situation because you have a parent a lot of times mm -hmm. it's not only saying the child is sick but making the child sick right. in order to appear sick. And, right. and it's like 90% of the time it's women who do this to their children. They can even do it to animals. But it is apparent, however, that these people who do have, who do have uh, Munchausen syndrome, uh, they are sick. It's just no, they, I know. Need, they, need, <laughs> just a, they a need a doctor, it's just a different kind of doctor. So. <laughs> and it's different from hypochondria, which if you're hypochondriac, then you really believe there's something wrong with you. But Munchausen means that you are faking it. Now you, mm. like, are a hypochondriac, right, Mr. Barcel? <laughs> no, I, I deny the charge. And furthermore, <laughs> with respect to Munchausen syndrome, I have to admire the, the, whoever dreamed that one up. When I was a young law student, we used to call it by a much shorter word, fraud. <laughs> well, there's also something new called Munchausen by Internet um, for the new age. Mm -hmm. And it actually, people go on the Internet and they pretend either they invent a character or they say that they're sick. And they go into support forums and, get, and everything. Exactly. And they get all the sympathy, on the, and which is, you know, the best way to do it if you're going to do it. Right. It's the I, least, I suppose you know, so. Dangerous. <laughs> Seriously, though. Um, don't you think calling it fraud is really more to the point? You can, you can treat it a lot easier. Or is this supposed to be some you know, wonderful new... Not only, well, do, you, not only do you get the benefit of, of your f fakery, but also perhaps you can then get years of treatment to is try it, to cure you. Isn't fraud usually illegal? Am I wrong? Whereas this is actually just kind of unethical in most people's opinion to just lie about being sick. So that would ah. maybe be the difference. Ah. 
But talking about the internet, uh, I was going to bring up Sarah Palin's email account, which was breached, um, allegedly by the son of a Democratic congressman from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and what it brought, you know, to the, brought home was the, the fact that it's very easy to get personal data and passwords, et cetera, on the internet. In fact, I found tons of articles about people who had said to their friends, do you mind if I get into your bank account? And they would actually use the, usually it's the forgotten password, and then they ask you these questions, you know, mm -hmm. like where, what year were you born, what's mm -hmm. your zip code, whatever it may be, and they feel that they can find that information on the internet usually, because people right. put information on blogs, et cetera, and then they're able to get a new password and get into a bank account or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, are you worried about um, someone getting your private information on the internet? Have you had any experiences that are worrisome? I'm very worried about people getting hold of my money. <laughs> but as for privacy, I think on the whole it's greatly overrated. Well, consider go back a few hundred, go back, you know, not too long, 100, 200, 300. Years? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> they, no, people in those days did not leave pri lead private lives. Look at Louis XIV. Well, I'm sure you have looked at Louis XIV. <laughs> I have in detail. No, 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 no moment of his life was spent in privacy. No moment at all. I mean, literally, no moment. So, this this expectation of privacy that we have nowadays is is, is really quite new, and it seems to be vanishing rapidly. But it doesn't really matter because there are so many people nowadays that who can be bothered. Well, I actually think it's a big problem, and I think, and I take precautions. I should take more precautions. But what they, the experts say to do is, when you have these questions that you know, like for example, they ask you what your zip code is, mm -hmm. you shouldn't put in your real zip code. You should have fake hmm. answers on a sheet that you use to answer those questions. You should not use the real answers. And I even have like a different password for every single internet site, every single account, which of course I have to keep them in a little right, book. Right. And if I lose the book, I'm in really big mm -hmm. trouble. <laughs> but I'm so worried that somebody could get the one password, right. and I don't want them to get right. access to anything else. Well, one thing that we're talking about here is a, is a couple of different things. We're talking about identity theft, obviously, is a concern to a lot of people, mm -hmm. but we're also talking about violation of privacy. Um, in regards to Sarah Palin's email being hacked, uh, she had every right to use the government email access accounts that they give to people who are heads of state and senators and congressmen and everything. Mm -hmm. But instead of doing that, she did, she conducted official business on a Yahoo account, which are much more easily hacked than, say, a government account. Um, so first of all, not a smart move for her. Um, then in regards to privacy and violation of privacy, a lot of people out there who are just putting everything out there on Facebook, on MySpace, on blogs and everything, kind of in a way are asking for it. I mean, anybody who's doing a website dedicated to their children with their first name, their last name, the neighborhood they grow up in or anything are asking for predators to come right. in and nab their children. It's just something you definitely need to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, as far as identity theft goes, I don't really have any concerns for that just as long as uh, I see that little uh, lock up in the corner of the web browser that tells you it's an encrypted site with a uh, uh, Secure socket layer. Well, they have technology. lately one of the big problems, and I think there are like nine million websites that are still not secure. But Microsoft, some people at Microsoft found a glitch where um, you know there's an IP address, but there's also a domain name. Hmm. And so what the, some of these people were doing, they were it's like a phishing type of scheme. Right. But what they would do is they would change those numbers, that IP address. Mm -hmm. So you put in the domain, it would go to a fake site that looked just like the real site. And there's still lots of holes on the internet. They're all right now in the process of trying to get them patched but so you have to be very careful I mean probably most of the major companies mm -hmm. have already patched it but as of May this was only discovered like in May okay and July is when it came out and people started trying to patch very quickly so, so. I, I wasn't really concerned about identity theft but now, now you are Thank you very much. <laughs> That's good. Well, we're not identity is a purely abstract concept <laughs> the thing that you're gonna get that you're gonna lose is your money that's the thing that needs to be protected. However, I think, unless you're constant, well, I think to the extent that you access your own bank accounts online, I think the bank is on the hook and you're not because they're offering that service. As for identity and as for privacy, isn't it a little bit overdone, really? Uh, not necessarily, uh, because so. if somebody actually is able to get into your accounts or open up other accounts underneath your name, oh, yeah. your credit is what's at stake, not necessarily the your money. Credit score is going to plummet. Yeah, it can be. So. What would you rather then? 
have your identity stolen or be attacked on the street and beaten <laughs> senseless. It's a no-brainer for as far as I'm concerned. Depends on how bad the <laughs> attack on the street was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we live in a world where, you know, we're, we're always encouraged to worry about things that aren't that important. Well, uh, exactly. I'm more, I'm more uh, wary of somebody breaking into my house or leaving a door unlocked than I am of somebody stealing my identity mm -hmm. online. So. Well, you know, medical privacy is it, it's enchanting. When you go into a doctor's office, they, they show you their privacy, HIPAA privacy policy, you sign it, you can't read it because even a lawyer can't decipher it. But then you know they're looking inside you and wiping your <laughs> bottom and st st taking your blood and you see, what is all this privacy business? Well, <laughs> and by the way, if an insurance company, which, which I guess is important, wants the information, they always get it. So again, I think this is like a false problem with a false solution. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Quite right. Uh, yes. News. <laughs> Where do you get your news? Do you, um, this was a question actually asked of Sarah Palin. She said, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, anything. <laughs> I everything. mean everything. Oh. <laughs> but where do you get your news? Do you get it from the internet? Do you get it from mainstream media? Or both? Well, you can't get news either on the internet or from mainstream media. What you get from those sources is called noise. <laughs> and, the less, and the less you expose yourself to noise, the better. If you want to get news and information, you should read books. That's well, where books are not news. That's old news. By the time it's published, it's no longer news. That, well, it's a great it's source for history. knowledge. It's True. called history. No, new, that's okay. News, noise. There is no difference. Well, people that today there are a lot of people called integrators, who are people that both use internet sources and use mainstream media, mm -hmm. and that's actually what I do too. And um, so they look at both. But when you're talking about um, cable news, do you watch a particular? I know you watch cable news. Do you watch cable news? No, oh, absolutely. And do you have a particular channel that you watch most frequently? I probably watch a lot of CNN. One thing I've realized that they do is they've definitely got, gotten into the arena of uh, infotainment with their high-speed graphics and their riveting music and, and all the that charts, other stuff. Yes. And, and the charts and this and that and the other thing. Um, where, uh, but I find it to be probably the least biased out of most of them because uh, MSNBC, I do watch that a lot, but I do think they lean very heavily to the left. Mm -hmm. um, and then Fox News, I think we know where you know <laughs> which way they lean. Um, and then okay, well, that's interesting a lot that of the radio as well. That's so. interesting you say that, and because there's a study out and. Which one do you think? You think MSNBC is watched by mostly Democrats? You I think didn't more say that. Or more Democrats the way they, the way they that. No, I didn't say that either. Oh. The way they report is more left-leaning. Okay. The way Fox reports is more right-leaning. And CNN, um, no, I, I agree with I agree with the way the perception is. But mm -hmm. it's interesting. The Pew Research Survey shows that more Democrats watch CNN, and that the most quote fair and balanced is Fox News, funny enough, because they have the most equal number of Democrats, independents, and Republicans who watch their channel. But you can't tell how, how fair somebody is by uh, who, watches. who watches it. It's how they report. And then once again, then that's subjective. Right. So That's true. I think that a lot of people would agree, though, with your analysis of the, mm. of the channels. Well, it's very fascinating, but it's certainly not news. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> do, you watch do you watch football or any sport on, the, on TV? Right now, the elections is my World Series. Uh, okay. So, well, let me ask you a question. If you watch a football match on television, would you call that news? Wait, are you talking about soccer or American football? American football. Okay. American football. Yeah, would you call news, that if it's happening right now? I would. You could say the play-by-play. -play, you'd call that news. Yeah. Because that is really what the reporting of the election is. It just goes on a lot mm -hmm. longer. It's not actually news. The news is, um, the news, which we know what the news is. There's going to be an election for president. We already knew that, though. And then uh, on November 4, we're going to find out. Is it November 4? We're going to find out who mm -hmm. that person is. That's Hopefully. the news. Hopefully. Everything in between is, this new, is, is noise. Watch it, watch it, play by play. McCain's up, Obama's up. Da, da. I say again, if you want news, read a book. What do you think of the Fairness Doctrine? <laughs> <laughs> is that a variation on the Bush Doctrine? <laughs> because if it is, I don't know what it is. In, in what respect, Charlotte? <laughs> <laughs> in what respect? Okay. Well, yes, I think we need a fairness doctrine, and that ties directly into health care. Well, well the, fairness, <laughs> the fairness doctrine was in place until um, it was actually it, it repealed in 1985. It was in place since 1967. Okay. And basically it meant that when there was a controversial <clears throat> topic that broadcasters were supposed to present 
the other side of that controversial issue. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, there's kind of this assumption, and I don't know if it's spelled out, but that there, there's an assumption that there are like two sides to an issue, which in my view, my problem with the fairness doctrine is I think that there are more than two sides to an issue. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, when you see on television, you almost always see this right versus left, which of course leaves out not only the independent viewpoint, of which 40% of this country identifies independents who are not right or left, but it also leaves out other viewpoints. Mm -hmm. An example would be like stem cell research, where the left may have their point of view and the right may have their point of view. And I, as an animal rights person, may say, oh, how is this going to affect animals? That's the discussion I want to have. Mm -hmm. That's not a discussion I'm going to hear on the news in general. That's something, even if the fairness doctrine were in place, that discussion would not be heard. So the reason why this came up so much is because of the illegal immigration issue with the um, Immigration Reform Act a couple of years back. And Congress wanted to put this in place. And talk radio went crazy. And so Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, got very upset about the idea that talk radio had so much power. Mm -hmm. And so that's when they said, oh, we need to, to bring the Fairness Doctrine back because we, we can't have talk radio having this kind of power, and talk radio tends to be further right in general. So. Right, well, that's very interesting. Um, I think science is working on a solution for that, Charlotte, so that every, science is working on a, uh, on a way to stretch every minute by a factor of 200, so that a, a half hour news show will last many, many hours, half a day, and that will afford everyone the opportunity to express multiple viewpoints. That's my ridiculous bit. And my other bit is... <laughs> is that the first ridiculous thing you said today? <laughs> and the other bit is as follows. <laughs> Everything you see on te television is, is not worth watching, and therefore watching two not worth watching viewpoints doesn't really help one way or another. The thing to do is never believe anything that, that you hear on TV. You're awfully cynical today. I, I am. I've told I you think there's some excellent... I mean, I think cable news is excellent. I think you get some I, interesting I, I, insights. Ask my friend Bryce de v Vincenzi. <laughs> <laughs> but he can't say your say name either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's very important, actually, to, to have the two different viewpoints. But one thing to, to keep in mind is that all of the media that's out there is controlled by how many companies? Five companies. Controls everything. Mm -hmm. And those five companies, when they're in the media, they depend on advertising dollars. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times those advertising dollars are going to dictate what is said and what is not. Mm -hmm. So if you have a story about Monsanto and a dairy supplement that they or a supplement that they give dairy cows so they produce more milk but it causes cancer in the cows or whatever, right. who's going to report that? Right. No, I know. It's a, so, it's a problem. So the fairness doctrine in itself is is a great idea. But I think until the entire media industry is completely deregulated and you have fewer companies, or excuse me, more, more companies, companies, more companies having uh, more of a say and there's more competition, then people will gravitate towards somebody who is a little bit more fair and balanced. Mm -hmm. Well, the people right now, they did a poll recently, and it, it used to be that people were not in favor, but now there's actually a majority of people that are in favor of putting the Fairness Doctrine back in mm -hmm. place. Well, it, not for I, the internet, but for mainstream media. It, it's not a matter of whether what they say is fair and balanced. It's a matter of whether what they say is intelligent. Mm -hmm. By your measure. Could, could we have an intelligence doctrine and do away with a fair and balanced Can we please doctrine? have an intelligence but who's doctrine? But who's the measure of the intelligence doctrine? It will be me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> well, that's, that's for, I mean, when you, have, when you have the right and when you have the left and they're, they're both going at it and, and, and duking it out and everything, I think it's best to take what both sides have to say with a grain of salt. Because oh, of course. Everybody's, I mean, tr everybody's trying to push forward their own agenda. And whenever somebody sends me an email forward or something saying something disparaging about a certain somebody uh, who's running for office or whatever, oh, no, I would say, well, what is the source? Critical and analysis. What, is the, what is their agenda? Why are they putting it oh, out absolutely. there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would like to see more independent views. I mean, I, I, that's what really bothers me is that everybody just assumes that everybody's either a liberal or a conservative and there's no other There's a lot of people in the middle. A lot. Tons. I mean, it's a majority. It's a majority. It's a yeah. majority, but... That's not what the liberals and conservatives want you to think. Right. So, best well, it's cities. A, every little boy or girl, what's born into this world alive, is either a little liberal or a little conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so, who else is there? You're That's in a very unusual <laughs> mood today. I, I think, have to I, say. Think, I think everybody's a little bit conservative and everybody's a little bit liberal into themselves. Ah. 
Well, it depends on the issue, I think. <laughs> I think it's completely thank you. subjective. That was, thank you. That, that was cute? fair and balanced. <laughs> so, all, right. all right. Best U.S. cities to earn a living. Do you have a guess? This is from Forbes, and it largely has to do with what cities have companies, the, the best companies in their view, the best business envi environment. Um, what the median income Houston. is, the cost of living. Seattle. Houston is number one. I read the article. Ah, you can't answer the question. <laughs> Seattle. <laughs> Seattle is not on there. Well, it should be because Boeing's there. Is Boeing like oh, okay? How, is actually is Phoenix on there? Well, Houston's on there because also because the oil industry. That was mm -hmm. one reason. Los Phoenix, An Los is Angeles. Not, Los Angeles is not well, on it there. It should be because of the movie industry. I know, what's the matter with these people? New they York. Got <laughs> New York is number five. So num Minneapolis is number two. They said the most top companies are in Minneapolis. I've really? never even heard of anybody being, I don't know who's in Minneapolis. Hmm. Boston is three, Washington DC is four, New York five, Pittsburgh six, San Francisco seven, Dallas eight, Milwaukee nine, and Philadelphia 10. But it sounds, it sounds like according to Sarah Palin, those aren't the real America. It's not, yeah. uh, that's right. That's Sarah America. would not approve of this list. Yes. <laughs> well, I certainly understand Milwaukee. <laughs> Yeah. And then the ones that have the most um, jobs are declining in Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Detroit. In fact, they say that we've lost, as of this morning I heard, we've lost 750,000 jobs so far this year, and they mm -hmm. say it's going to be 950,000 by the end of October. So right. that's actually a huge issue. Um, the economy is next, and that's, we, I wanted to discuss the economy. Um, Do we have two minutes for that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, what did you think of the bailout? Did you support the bailout? Or do you think that was a good idea? I mean, this is we discussed the economy in the last show, but we didn't really I'm, get to finish our look, discussion. I'd like to I'm invite not, my brilliant young friend to address that. I'm not brilliant on this. I'm not an economist by any, any way, shape, or means. Um, and what I definitely did not approve of is, is a three-page outline of saying what the, what the bailout is going to do. So I, especially one, there's, uh, there's not going to be any not going to be any oversight. You can't review anything. That was absolutely ridiculous. The original. The original. the original. So kudos to those people in Congress who said, we need to have oversight. We need to have a say. Um, what about the people, the, the little man, the homeowners, et cetera? We have to help out those people, too. Um, but as far as whether it's going to work, whether it's just going to stop the bleeding for a little while, I, I have no See, idea. See, I was against the bailout. and. And I, I, you know, I always like to say the controversial thing, but uh -huh. I think that we should have just provided loans and, and, my, and my, to the banks. But my second choice was, is there 87, what are there, 87 million owner-occupied properties in this country? Mm -hmm. So I say, pay down the mortgage, $8,000 on each, if you're gonna spend $700 billion, mm -hmm. that's $8,000 per loan that could be paid down if someone's already paid off their loan. How much is that per loan? $8,000. Okay. And so that would mean if you have a you know two hundred thousand dollar loan, you get eight thousand off, or you know whatever mm -hmm. it might be. In some places, obviously, loans are less expensive in Mid America than right. in say Los Angeles. And then if you already had your loan paid off, you would get eight thousand dollars to invest in the stock market, which would help stimulate the stock market. And you would be required to leave it in the stock market for a period of time, in huh. order to help stimulate the stock market in some way. Okay, just when or you said you, you could go ahead and invest in the stock market, <laughs> my heart jumped into my throat because I'm like, that is the last thing I would do in this economy. Is well, I mean, but market. that's what our economy needs is more money put into it. That's the whole point to try to kind of regenerate things. And so the, what we're trying to do is get the banks with more money. So if you're mm -hmm. paying down loans, that's giving the banks more money to play with so they can give credit and you can re-stimulate. And putting money into the stock market mm -hmm. re-stimulates. That's See, my rationale. The, the, the big thing is, is like, I have no idea what would have happened if we didn't do the 700 billion dollar bail. I have no no idea what would have happened. I well, can't imagine can't fathom. But what about uh, taking a large chunk of that 700 billion or 840 billion, wherever it is now, and investing in infrastructure, education, um, job growth, production, manufacturing, all these other things that actually help stimulate the economy too by putting people to work and right. getting them jobs, and then they start buying things again, and the, and the economy starts moving that way. Right. No, Once again, I'm not an economist, so I don't well, what do you, When you said, like, helping the little guy, I mean, what do you think of stated income loans and no qualifying loans? Because you're a real estate agent. I'm also a real estate agent. Are, are we off the economy now? Yeah, no, he didn't, he didn't say nearly enough of the economy. This is, we're so. still on okay. the topic, of stated course. Stated income loans, yeah. No, this is part of the economy. What, what do we think? You you are both realtors. I'm not changing to mm -hmm. real estate. I'm saying that, you know, this, this has a lot to do because 
Schumer, for, Senator Schumer, for example, says that this is the re this is one of the reasons why we had this entire crash, right. and that they should be eliminated altogether. Now, I've been an agent for 21 years, and these loans have been around ever since the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were around 21 years ago, and there was, was absolutely no problem with these loans. Mm -hmm. And I think they're crucial, but now you hear government and you mm -hmm. hear the media saying that these kinds of loans need to be eliminated. So-called liar loans, or whatever you want to call them, but they're not always liar loans. I mean, there are certain people that can only qualify with something that's... I, I, think, I think there should definitely be a, a minimum as far as like the information that is provided uh, with you should have a decent credit score, you should have a decent income, you should be able to document that to a certain extent. Well, then that's not a, that's not a no qualifying loan. Right. A credit score, yes. I mean, that's the way it always was done. You had to have the credit score, you had to have show that you had enough money in the bank mm -hmm. and maybe a couple months or three months of payments in the bank in addition to closing costs and then the ha property had to appraise. That's how it always was. Now, mm -hmm. it got more lenient in the last couple of years when they started giving loans to people that had bad credit scores. And I'm not suggesting that's a good idea. Right. But the way it was before, I didn't see a problem. And we so didn't have So you, uh, who are you to suggest anything, since you're not about to lend anyone money? I say people who lend money should make up their own rules. Hmm. The rule I'd make up is if you, want, if you want to buy a house, you've got to have some money to put down because... If someone states their income or doesn't state their income, or if they're subject to so ridiculous intrusion into their financial life, who cares? Mm -hmm. the, if they're putting down 25, 30 percent, then the bank is safe. Right. And that's and all you need to know. You don't, the idea of a nationwide regulation to cover everywhere from Houston to May, whatever. <laughs> We've been drinking before the show. <laughs> <laughs> Houston, Seattle, Maine to San Diego. It doesn't matter. Let, let the banks make their own regulations, and then they would they wouldn't they wouldn't risk it in a stupid way. The reason for this ridiculous crisis is part is is substantially because the government leaned on the financial institutions to lower their standards and and really leaned on them to lend money when it wasn't viable, and the banks said. But well, we're not going to do that unless you backstop, unless you guarantee. And so government said, yeah, we'll guarantee. This is actually called socialization of housing by the back door. It's blown up. If you want to socialize housing, the best thing to do is to socialize it, not pretend that you're doing it in the capitalist system. That's the last word on that subject. I agree with what he said. OK, well, <laughs> it looks like we're out of time, but I want to thank you both for joining me today. And I hope we brought some uncommon sense into your life. As you putter through your day, remember, everybody's wrong but me. And him, and him. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's, it's, it zips by, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like the world is run by chimpanzees Even though some of them might come with college degrees It's getting hard to separate the facts from fiction But I think I can say with obvious conviction That in this old world, everybody's wrong but me Everybody's wrong to disagree with me That really chaps my eye I thought it all through so very carefully There's no point in considering the other side